All right. So I guess we can start then. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the first session of the first ever uh, fully virtual ITF. Um, no wonder uh, it's taking us a little bit of time to <clears throat> uh, to ramp up. Uh, please have your video off and most importantly, please be muted unless you are speaking. Um, also, uh, if you'd like to to speak, if you'd like to be on the mic queue, uh, there's a chat um, a chat feature to WebEx. Uh, please say plus Q, and you will we will note your name, and we will call you to the mic. Uh, there's uh, an etherpad at the bottom of the etherpad is the blue sheet. I see many, many names already. Uh, just as a quick uh, public service announcement, if you're on VPN, you might very well uh, be unable to reach uh, etherpad because of the port it's using. Um, if you're unable to note your name, uh, please just send us an uh, email directly and uh, we will add you later. Um, next slide, please. Yes. The note will apply today just as it applies to any uh, physical or virtual uh, ITF meeting. Uh, next slide. Oh, maybe it's a good time to say that uh, I'm your own Sheffer and Dick. I'm the only one speaking, Mr. Hart. You start. I needed to give WebEx into my screen to share a screen. Well, apparently you are already sharing. Okay, I missed what you said earlier. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, I'm Aaron Sheffer, coach uh, of TX Auth, and you are? Oh, uh, Dick Hart, I'm co-chair of TX Auth, and I authored the X Auth uh, paper. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, that is the last of those slides. Okay, there should have been one more saying uh, XOS uh, status. Oh, wait, you were sharing? Okay. I wasn't is... sharing that. Oh, okay. So now, now we can see your screen, but uh, different. Okay, this is better. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me quickly go through the agenda and uh, please uh, let us know if you have any comments on the agenda. Um, we will st uh, start uh, with chair slides, then we will have a charter discussion. We realize that uh, uh, there are still uh, open points that people want to discuss about the charter. So we might go over 20 minutes, but at some point uh, we will need to uh, cut this discussion in order to discuss the two uh, possible starting points that we have uh, for the TXO protocol, which are XYZ uh, that uh, Justin will present and XO that uh, Dick will present. Uh, following that, and depending on how much time remains, we will talk about uh, differences uh, between the protocols and end with the uh, next steps uh, for this uh, both. Uh, 
Um, so a few words about uh, where we are right now. Uh, we just completed, uh, I believe two days ago, uh, a consensus call uh, for the uh, creation of a TX auth uh, working group. Uh, we had um, over 20 people in favor and uh, one person who, um, who was uh, opposed uh, to the creation uh, of the working group, uh, but still uh, would like to take to take part uh, if and if and when it is created. Uh, given uh, uh, this uh, uh, reaction on the mailing list, um, the next step is for IESG uh, to make a decision on whether a working group uh, will be created based on uh, what uh, we've seen on the mailing list, as well as uh, this discussion today. Um, Pete, to answer your question, yes, Dick is responsible uh, for the queue. Um, so uh, let's uh, open it up uh, for agenda bashing. Oh, there's that one. So who is plus Q? Uh, Annabelle's on the queue. Annabelle. Um, so let me do it for Dick. Annabelle, can you please unmute and yeah. speak up? Yes. Hi, Annabelle Backman, Amazon. Um, uh, we're doing a bit agenda bashing, right? I know we're yeah. past the agenda slide, so okay. Um, yeah, I want to kind of reiterate what I asked for on the mailing list, which is I, I really think we need to add a little more structure than just 20 minutes for charter discussion, because it seems like there's a, a handful of key items for debate, and it would be helpful, I think, for us to make sure we get a chance to talk about uh, all of them. Uh, and I could easily see some of, you know, like, for example, the question of to what extent identity is included in the charter is just taking up like 40 minutes of our time. Um, so I could respond to that. Uh, we, uh, we decided to, to keep it open for now. If we uh, realize that we're red holing on anything in, in specific, we will uh, ask to uh, to cut the line at that point. Dick, would you like to add anything? Uh, no. Am I sharing my video? I hope not. You are. Yes, you are. You are now. <laughs> this is not one of the easier pieces of software to use. Uh, no, we thought that we would, uh, if the charter discussion continued on, we would let that run in for 40 minutes and take the time off the end of the discussion of the protocols. I think my, my question or my concern is more around, as it is, the charter discussion is just sort of this big unstructured block of time. Um, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm hoping the chairs are going to be ordering that or orchestrating that uh, so that we can actually try and like maybe close out on, on topics and not just kind of jump around or keep jumping back to the same topics. Um, just a little concerning since like it's not assigned to anybody to lead that discussion or anything on the on the agenda. So hopefully there's some organization planned there. Yes. We'll time box things so they don't overrun run too long. So uh, specifically, you mentioned, uh, you, Annabelle, mentioned uh, identity. I think we should uh, start there. This seems to be uh, the, the most important uh, 
a subject that people brought up. So if people have an opinion uh, in favor of including identity in the charter against or something in between, uh, please uh, uh, add yourself to the queue and uh, let's get, get going on identity. Go ahead, Annabelle. So, um, Annabelle back from Amazon again. Uh, before that, I want to just quickly preface all of this discussion with you know, the way I see it, the charter should be about you know dis outlining the problems we're trying to solve. Um, and I think a, a lot of the suggestions, a lot of the di discussions and debates uh, that are coming up on the mailing list stem from people trying to put um, trying to define in the charter the solution to the problem we're solving rather than the pro describing the problem itself. Uh, I, 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 I think the solution part is really where we need to get to have those discussions in the working group and decide at, you know, when we're designing the protocol what's going in it. Um, so just, I, may, maybe other people don't see it that way, but if that makes sense to you, then just you know, try and keep that in the back of your mind as, as you as, as we discuss this. Um, on identity, I think there, again, specifically, is a, a, there's a lot of room for us to go into, to, to, to get clearer about what it is we're talking about and what problems we're trying to solve when we say, oh, we're going to put identity in the charter. Uh, does that mean we're you know, communicating uh, claims about a subject? Does that mean we are solving you know, session management between the uh, and 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 authentication server and a client uh, does that mean something else in between there? Uh, it, 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 I think different people are having coming to this with their own ideas about what that word means. So let's try to be very specific about that. Quick uh, procedural note, please don't use the, ch the WebEx chat for anything other than adding yourself to the queue. Who's uh, next? Yeah, Mike is in the queue next. Mike? Sure. Um, for the discussions on the list, uh, I think it would be fairly important to understand what are the use cases we're trying to solve uh, before we would decide to rule identity in. And as Annabelle just said, identity is a lot of things. Sometimes it's just claims when you authenticate. Sometimes it's session management. Uh, sometimes it has a whole lot more. And I would like to see us scope this uh, small enough that it's actually achievable and adding unique value and just reusing identity stuff that's already defined where possible. But again, I think we should be starting with use cases and or architecture, as Nat said, rather than starting with uh, drafts. Thanks, Mike. Uh, the queue looks empty to me. Roman? Hi. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on what you had said, Mike. I mean, what would you be looking for relative to the current charter language, which makes some references to the use cases? Um, I would actually want some use cases written down, like what are we trying to solve? What are the likely roles and, of the participants? Um, why is a unique solution needed for some of these things? And to, to the identity question, 
what aspects of identity are needed by these use cases and what are we ruling out and what are we reusing? Right now, it's just sort of a grab bag. I do appreciate the new language that Justin and Dick came up with a few days ago. I think on Saturday, I proposed a tweak to it to try to scope that to something achievable, but um, I'd like to see much more focus on reuse and writing the use cases. Uh, Dick Hart here in the queue. The charter talks about sort of Open ID Connect and OAuth as sort of being something that covers those use cases. Uh, is that that sounds fairly clear to me? I, I think the for myself, I was interested in identity uh, because Open ID Connect uses OAuth and Having, thinking about the identity use cases that OpenID Connect solves and making sure that those are all solved in TX auth as opposed to a group tacking it on and uh, having to deal with whatever came out of TX auth for what they're doing in identity made more sense to solve it holistically as opposed to separately. Although, again, identity is many things. Just releasing claims on authentication time is easy. Are you including the logout parts of OpenID Connect and the session management parts? I mean, that's what's needed for an end-to-end -end solution. There's more of identity for aggregated and distributed claims. There's verified claims. Uh, there's a whole bunch. And the charter is not at all clear whether you're just talking about releasing claims and you know, have a nice day, or whether you're building an end-to-end -end identity system. And I think the latter is hard, having done it. I think the OpenID Connect uh, features, and I think also that reuse is a key thing, right? I, I don't think we need to re reinvent anything, but we don't want to have people that are building identity stuff having to figure out how to go and shoehorn it into TX off. Uh, Annabelle's next in the queue. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm glad we're talking about use cases. Uh, I'll start with a, putting a couple out there. Um, I, I, I think the most obvious use case is kind of the, uh, the one that uh, Mike, I think you're getting at with just the a little bit is, or and 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 Dick as well is just the ability to support uh, an, an, a authentication protocol like OpenID Connect over TX Auth or over over whatever protocol we we come up with. Um, you know, OpenID Connect had to invent a bunch of stuff on top of OAuth to. Um, I, I think the goal here, one of the goals for us ought to be to um, make that unnecessary, uh, not necessarily to, to, that doesn't necessarily mean reinventing everything, but uh, whatever protocol we come up with, it should be clear and obvious how you do a full-fledged identity system on top of that. And maybe that means Maybe all that means is we have a way of of you know talking about claims and we're li or maybe we're lifting that from OIDC, um, and then you know once once you get your your tokens you're just doing everything that's been built on OIDC from there. I I, I don't know, but um, it might be helpful to kind of to to put the charter language in those terms. You know, to put it less about just we're going to do identity and more about we're going to enable identity to work over this thing. Um, another uh, use case I want to throw in here, because it's a little decoupled from OIDC, is um, uh, the the ability to communicate to the authorization server uh, the identity that you are that the that the client is expecting. Um, one of the problems OAuth two has. Uh, especially if you're trying to do 
um, incremental authorization is there's no real good way for the client to tell the OAuth2 authorization server who they expect or who they require the subject to be. And so if you're doing incremental auth it's entirely possible that the subject, the resource owner, uh, that for the tokens you get back in this incremental authorization is different from the ones you started with before. So you know, if you're trying to do an incremental auth to get access to, you know, you've got access to resources A, now you need access to resource B in that same resource owner account, it's possible what you end up with is access to resource B in a totally different account. Um, and you don't really, uh, just with OAuth2, you don't really have any good way of determining that's the case. And that can lead to some really weird broken experiences. Um, so that's something that I would like to, I, I, I think is squarely you know, needed with just within the authorization domain, even if you're not doing any sort of like authentication into the client using that or any sort of like shared uh, session management or anything like that. Um, that's something that's missing in OAuth2 that I would like to see here. <clears throat> um, the last point I'll add on, on that is talking about reuse and talking about claims. Um, one thing that I would like to steer clear of is having multiple structured languages for talking about, uh, like, you know, one structured language for talking about resources that I'm as asking for authorization for, and another structured language for talking about claims. Um, and so if, if we're keeping those as two separate things, I think there's a risk of that. So um, I think that would just be unnecessarily complex, and unnecessarily confusing. So um, yeah, as we talk about reuse, think about things like that. Thanks. And Okay, so I had two points, one of which is real quick, just to remind everyone that when we're writing the charter text, uh, the charter needs to be understandable by people who are not conversant with the details of OpenID Connect. Uh, and so if we're talking about you know, doing identity uh, in terms of the functionality that OpenID Connect does, we should describe that a little bit more when we start to put that into charter text. Uh, so we don't have to expect people to go read up on OpenID Connect. Uh, and then my second point, which is a little bit more detailed, is uh, that coming into today, you know, based on what I had read, which is incomplete of the mailing list, my understanding was that when we talked about identity, we could perhaps say that TXAuth wants to be able to convey you know, some information or claims from the AS to the RS. And it just so happens that some of those claims or information might relate to the identity of the, uh, the user, say. Um, so that's just sort of calling that out as a particular type of information that we would want to be transacting uh, as opposed to being necessarily a fundamentally different thing. Having now just listened to what Annabelle was saying, though, I'm no longer sure that's the case. So uh, it would help me personally to have a little bit more clarity about whether my, my initial understanding was correct, that we were just having identity information as a class of claim that we are conveying, but it is not sort of privileged in some, some other sense. Uh, Colin is next in the queue. Uh, so D Dick's answer that the the use cases were the like the the OAuth two and the OpenID Connect um, use cases sort of sort of surprised me. And I'm wondering if anyone could speak to what are the use cases that we want to solve with this working group that that aren't already covered by one of those existing uh, or well by OpenID Connect basically. Um, could, could somebody talk about that and and and, and get those into the charter a bit more? A question to Colin. Uh, as far as I understand, the charter does actually uh, mention the motivation. Uh, what exactly uh, is missing in the initial part of the charter text for you? Uh, the way I read the charter, and I've, I've read the mailing list track and the, the stuff on here, it almost seemed to me like uh, OAuth2 would would solve most of the things that I understood there. So if there were specific use cases that OAuth2 does not meet, it would be great to at least have a better understanding of them for, for this group of people here right now. And, and maybe that would result in an update of the charter as well. 
Uh, but if the use case is purely to just redo the use cases that OAuth 2 and OAuth does in another standards organization, I mean, write that down. Go for it. I'm, you know, but let's be clear about which of the two it is. So uh, I'll just respond to that somewhat to help provide some clarity. The use cases of OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, um, it, you can kind of view those fairly broadly. And so there's a number of things that don't work uh, today with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, which is what's driving this new work. Um, and you know, while you can solve a fair amount of identity things with OpenID Connect, uh, the concern and why I wanted to have identity in the TX auth charter was that someone's going to go and deploy TX auth. Not only are they going to want authorization, but they're also going to want identity because that's a common pattern. And so while somebody might be able to solve the identity with just open ID connect on top of OAuth, they wouldn't be able to solve it when they're using TX auth unless they also had the same features that open ID connect offers within TX auth. Does that Clarify things, Colin? That does, yeah. Okay. Next in the queue is Justin. Yeah, really just um, seconding that, that um, we wanted to really bring into um, the fold uh, some of the core identity uh, capabilities of OpenID Connect. And I really see that, um, and as I tried to reflect in the latest version of the charter text, as you know, releasing a couple of identifiers, um, you know, really basic claims about the user, um, being able to release a um, set of assertions from the AS, and to Annabelle's point, being able to present identity information on the request, um, and beyond just a, um, a notion of who the user might be, but uh, if I'm using, uh, you know, verifiable credential proofs, I can actually prove that, you know, the user really did authenticate to me um, as a piece of software. Uh, cryptographically, and there are other protocols that allow me to do that, and TXOS should be able to convey that information as well. We are not looking, at least it was never my intent, uh, for us to define a full end-to-end -end identity ecosystem here, but I think that it would behoove us to have the basic hooks in the right place so that we don't end up in a space where, uh, like Dick was saying, people take TX off and just kind of build something on it which as great as OpenID Connect is, that's kind of where the internet is today with OAuth 2, uh, because we've got a lot, lot, lot of OAuth 2 based identity protocols that are not OpenID Connect out there. And so by having at least the basics of identity um, and authenticating to the client as part of the, uh, the protocol, and whether that's in the core document or second document, that's a different discussion. But having that defined here in this group, and to Annabelle's point, um, you know, extensions on where you can kind of it make it obvious and where you would build all of this other stuff, whether you know, and that should probably happen in another group, then I think it's that's really the best direction that we can go. Now, whether we pull those bits and pieces from OpenID Connect or from Skim or from Facebook or from verifiable credentials or wherever, that's something that the working group needs to decide what makes the most sense, right? We are not presuming, um, it, we, and the charter cannot presume an existing um, answer to those questions, but it can provide the right framework for those questions. So that's why if you look at the current charter text, it says, you know, including asserted identity claims and approval of AS attestation to identity claims. And it's, it really is in those specific terms uh, that I, I think the details lie. Tony's next in the queue. Yeah, um, so along with everybody else, identity is quite large, I think, uh, you know, just to state as it's currently stated in the charter. And yet there's no connection at all with authentication and how the uh, binding would happen with, the authentic, with, a, with an authentication mechanism to actually obtain identity. So I'm still missing why identity would be in there and 
and authentication wouldn't necessarily be in, in the scope of the charter. I'm not suggesting that it should be, but I don't see how you can have either of them without the binding between the two. Um, I think it's too much to, to take on in this particular charter. Um, you know, the world of identity, it's quite large, you know, goes from proofing, you know, all the way to validation and things like that. So there's a lot of other groups doing multitude of work in this space. And I don't think it's worth time wasting it in this group to, to rehash some of that stuff. Thanks. And Tony, you know, once again, I think the goal of the charter is to make sure that people aren't having to tack stuff onto TX off. And so go yeah, to TX just off to all the existing things, not reinventing anything. Right. And so I think that's where it can be a lot clearer because it's not currently just saying it's, it's there to absorb existing frameworks or existing technologies that are out there. It's, it lends you one to believe it's reinventing identity in some in some particular case. So just to jump in as the AD, this is Ben Kadak. Um, Tony, you want the clarification to be about sort of the way that we plan to use existing authentication stuff and have that tie into the identity information that we're we're conveying. Yeah, both identity. Yeah, you know, how how existing authentication and existing identity can play into TX off. Okay, thanks. Uh, next in the queue is Mike. Um, if somebody's got the text of the charter handy, if they want to paste it into Jabber, just so um, maybe other people have it all available, or is it somewhere? People yeah, can so uh, so I can do that. I'm not on the Jabber channel. Um, I could put it on the Etherpad, but I know not everybody's on there either. Why don't you post it into the chat in WebEx? I've got the queue already, and we've cut oh. the queue. OK, I'll do that. So this is Mike Jones at Microsoft. Um, if, as Justin describes it, all that's being included is releasing some identity claims at authorization time, you're guaranteeing that you're going to have to build some additional layers, which uh, for instance, the session management, the logout, you don't just log in, you have to decide when to log out, you have to contact the logged in relying parties, uh, you have to get them logged out, um, you have to do the cookie management underneath, et cetera. Um, and I would rather there be a clean layering where Sure, we think about the experience we've learned from SAML and Connect and Facebook Connect and what have you, and think about where to do the cut for the layering. But, um, you know, to Torsten's point on the list, entities, identity is a really big topic. Uh, I think we will be much more likely to succeed in refactoring authorization if that's what we do and we leave the hooks where, for instance, you could build an OpenID Connect profile for TX auth, just like you have an OpenID Connect profile for different response types. I view TX auth as primarily creating a different kind of response type with different messages, but all the identity stuff should layer the same. And the charter, I'll close by saying this, the charter is completely ambiguous about whether session management is in or out. Uh, at a minimum, per the AD comments, uh, it has to be clear whether that's in scope or not, because just saying identity is wildly ambiguous. Uh, Torsen's next. We still don't have the whole charter in the queue yet. Go ahead, Torsten. <laughs> I think Justin will manage that. Post another said yes to come. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, identity is a broad topic, and um, I personally think TX auth should first of all focus on, on defining a new authorization protocol. Although there are 
some elements of identity that I think belong to the core of this of this new authorization protocol. Um, Annabelle just mentioned um, the incremental authorization. I, I fully agree. Um, that's a use case uh, that's purely solved or even not solved in the OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect space today. I even don't think it's really an identity use case because uh, I, I would like to see a solution that uh, tries to not really expose an identity uh, to, to, to allow um, a, rely, a client to, to, to um, upgrade an existing authorization with the same user. So we have done some work in that, uh, in that regard in the grant management protocol for OAuth 2. So I think that's, that's a re really reasonable use case that I'm supporting. Second use case is uh, providing identity in the, at the um, AS to RS interface. As I, as I said on the, on the, on the uh, mailing list, this is today in OAuth 2, this is no man's land. So everybody is, is doing it differently. And um, I think that's, that's, that's a viable use case because we need to somehow specify this interface in order to come up with interoperable solutions between ASs and RSs. And it brings me to my last two topics. First of all, and I think we already agreed on the list to, to make that part of the charter, um, interoperability of uh, all the three interfaces, um, client to AS, AS to RS, and client to RS must be in scope for that charter. I even went one step further and um, asked for um, testability. So the goal, my goal would be to have interoperability really on the on the on the um, on the wire level. And last but not least, um, we have discussed that over the course of the last week uh, intensively. I would like to see support in the new protocol for a great number of different um, designs for ways to manage tokens, from single single access token designs to multiple per RS um, access token designs. I've got some in. in Extensive conversations with the uh, with the editors of the two two uh, proposals that we have right now, and I feel that we we came up with a common understanding uh, that this is uh, covered by the current charter. The current charter text, as far as I see, doesn't have the text regarding interoperability and testability yet. Is that correct, Jaren? Uh, that's correct. The charter text that uh, I'm linking here is the charter text that uh, that we had for the consensus call. Uh, there are a few uh, a few changes that we agreed on on the mailing list following the consensus call, and that uh, Justin posted. Uh, so we will consolidate all of them and uh, and post them. But they're not they're not yet available in all in one place. Okay, thank you. Right. If I can just follow up with that, there are um, there's a small handful of changes. One, um, you know, towards the desk, uh, I mentioned uh, request versus request and response for part of it as a fine clarification. There was the note about interoperability. Um, there's a, a couple of small things like that that have not been incorporated and publicized yet. Uh, but then, you know, I've, I've got it up on my screen to, to add that stuff. Thanks, Justin. Uh, last person in the queue is George Fletcher. Uh, yep, uh, George Fletcher, Verizon Media. So in listening to this conversation, I feel like we're not trying to solve identity at all. We're trying to provide some standardization around identifiers and communication of claims. And maybe if we framed it in that, those kinds of terms, it would make this easier. I think that for adoption, we're going to have to hook into a bunch of existing identity infrastructures, right? When we start talking about the kinds of things that Mike talked about, um, and you know, in identity management, we're doing all sorts of full life cycle kinds of things. Only a small piece of those touch an authorization flow. So if the core element of what we're talking about is how do we represent an identifier? What are some core elements of identifiers? Some standardization around how those you know, core attributes get communicated, um, or maybe even some sort of schema that allows you to specify 
here's the the here's the the way I'm talking about these things and multiple can get slotted in. I, mean, I think for me, that's a lot clearer, right? And effectively the aspects like Tony was talking about of authentication or Mike was talking about session management, those things are left out of scope from a TXOF perspective. And we're just talking about where the intersection happens as it relates to authorization. Thanks, George. Um, well, we've cut off the queue. Uh, your own, do you wanna? Yeah, be before we move on to XYZ, uh, if there's anybody who feels that they have something essential that, uh, uh, an essential comment to make to the charter that's not squarely in, in the, uh, identity, what kind of identity, or how do we deal with identity? Uh, if there's anybody who still needs to to make a comment to the charter, up to three people, uh, please uh, add yourself to the queue. Otherwise, let's move on. Mike? Yeah, I think it's essential that we somehow do the equivalent of a hum about whether session management part of identity and identity proofing are in or out of scope and or whether we do layering to allow them. And I sure hope it comes out layering. But in, a, in a, any event, the charter has to say, right now it's just ambiguous. So, so this is Roman jumping in as the AD. I think it's going to be very tricky to do the humming. We're going to have to take this to the mailing list. I think we have a fairly uh, a fairly long list of uh, items we're going to need to sort out. And what I'd be interested in, and kind of the chair has kind of helped me out here, is I'm going to read a list. And if someone feels like this is not a bigger topic that we need discussion on, or I'm sorry, or you need to add. Uh, you know, add something to, to the list, you know, please kind of speak up. So, you know, going backwards, Mike, you just mentioned session management. We had multiple folks tell us that we need to have more precision on uh, on kind of what is the definition of identity. We talked a, a little bit about we need precision on are you inventing new stuff or are you going to be referencing other stuff? And then we had some feedback uh, from multiple parties around, you know, clarity and use cases given you know, given the current text. Is there someone else that wants to jump in the queue to say that their uh, their kind of feedback is not captured by those larger bullets? All right, I'm not so seeing anyone jump in over to you. Go ahead, Roman. No, no I was just saying over to you, Yaron. Uh, so, uh, just one more procedural point. Uh, we simply don't have a solution for humming at virtual meetings. So, everything will need to go uh, to the mailing list exclusively, uh, and we will be discussing uh, the points that were raised here. Uh, next on the agenda is Justin on XYZ. Oh. Uh, jump yeah, into for yeah, just a quick procedural bit. Um, would it be helpful if I tried to do a revision of the charter based on um, the comments that we've had uh, over the last week and um, a couple of comments here, like what George was just saying, um, and put that out? Um, because there's a couple of things that it seems clear we need to change. Um, so I'm asking. Should we do a revision first and then consensus on that? A discussion on the list obviously includes, uh, I mean, a, a charter change proposal is a very valid way of driving this discussion. So yes, please. Okay, I, I will I will note to myself to do that. Yeah. Co coordinate with us on that separately. Of course. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Of course, as as I have been. Uh, 
All yeah, right. Was that a plus one? Uh, there's a lot of plus, plus ones in the chat. This is, there was a couple of people in the queue. Oh, were there? Uh, I thought I yeah. was the one in the queue. Sorry. No, no. And um, when you took over, my window disappeared. I, I yes. lost my queue window. <laughs> oh, that's that's strange. That's, a, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, you should you should still have WebEx. It just will be in a different window. It's yeah. it's not the best UI. It really isn't. It's pretty. Yeah, my 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 chat window is suddenly gone. Can anybody else see the chat? Um, yeah. It, yeah, it looks like they are plus ones, not plus Qs. So I think that was just a, an intent okay. to, to signal a support say, that should have okay. gone to the Jabber room and not okay. trying to manage that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Too many chats. Okay. Okay. Um, so I am going to do my best to uh, be quick here and talk about the XYZ project which is something that I started uh, almost a year and a half ago now to make a uh, concrete set of suggestions uh, to address things that I was seeing in the wild in OAuth 2, um, including avoiding using the front channel to pass security information, uh, assuming everybody had web browsers, and making a lot of assumptions about how clients and keying and everything works. Uh, really just based on you know, the last decade of experience with how OAuth 2 works and where it is falling short today. So the goals of the project are to take care, uh, advantage of what we can do on the web today and kind of how deployments work, including things like being able to post JSON to an API, who would have thought? Um, but to enable things like rich resource requests, different kinds of interaction modes, different kinds of key presentation. And a key point uh, through the XYZ project was to allow OAuth 2's uh, use cases, but not necessarily repeat it exactly. Always question why something was uh, put in OAuth 2 and take a step back from that. One of the um, technologies that we make use of in designing the protocol is polymorphic JSON, which just very quickly means that if you've got a JSON object, the same field name could have a string value or a Boolean value or really any kind of JSON value in different circumstances. This doesn't mean that it's untyped. It means that each of those types has a very specific um, semantic associated with it. The philosophy was, uh, you know, borrowed from the very successful philosophy of OpenID Connect is to keep the simple things simple and make the complex things possible as, uh, as long as they don't mess up uh, the simple, keeping the simple things simple which meant that uh, every extension point needed to be very clearly defined and described. All of the elements needed to be very clearly modeled and uh, represented in the underlying systems, which for us was HTTP and JSON. And um, we also took a philosophy of only putting things in the spec if we were able to at least have a, have a toy implementation of it. Um, so there's a lot of ideas in XYZ that aren't in the spec. Speaking of implementations, we've got several in Java, Node.js for multiple teams, and we've run, um, you know, point-to-point -point interoperability with these things for both clients and uh, server side, uh, different signing and proofing mechanisms. There is an ID in the data tracker. A more full write-up for the entire project is on the website, OAuth.xyz. The reason for this is that it's a lot easier to describe things on a website where you can have, uh, you know, full diagrams and interactive bits and uh, links to videos and stuff like that than you can in um, specification text. Um, so uh, there's a lot more information there. So with that, I'm going to dive straight into the protocol, and I am going to be going fast and skimming over the tops and things so that we still have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, everything in XYZ starts with a uh, the client starting a transaction at the AS. So the client tells the AS, here's who I am and what I want. That looks like a JSON object. And uh, all of these different fields in the JSON object mean different, uh, mean specific things. So for example, as a delegation protocol, we wanna know what we're delegating access to. And we've got a uh, rich description language saying what I want, where I want it, what I wanna do, that kind of stuff here. And if this reminds you of OAuth rich authorization requests, there's very, very good reason for that. Is that RAR is basically kind of a, the, the content of RAR is kind of a backport of what we had done in XYZ into that, and that's intentional, and I think that that should continue. Um, client needs to be able to have, you know, some user-facing fields, that's not that interesting. 
Uh, what's more interesting is the client needs to be able to identify itself. And instead of identifying itself uh, with an abstract client identifier, we uh, identify clients using um, the keying material that they use to um, prove that they also prove with the presentation of the request. In this case, it's a JWK. And one of the places where we thought it was really important to have flexibility was in the key proofing mechanisms. So um, there's a way that you can do this in XYZ by using detached JWS signatures. Again, reusing stuff that's out there uh, and just signing the JSON of the HTTP message body. This is you know, fragile but functional in some cases. Uh, you could also use HTTP message signatures, uh, which um, was a community draft that uh, Annabelle and I are actually just, just now, as it's supposed to be this week, uh, bringing into the HTTP working group. So that's going to be new work going forward as well uh, that I think we should be able to leverage here. It's also MTLS, even DPOP style header signatures. There's a lot of things that different deployments of clients should be able to do here. So at this point, the AS can look at that incoming request and decide, well, maybe I've got all of the information I need and I can just issue you an access token. Because we're starting in the back channel, we can actually do that. This covers client credentials, the assertion flows, and a lot of other stuff in the OAuth, the wider OAuth ecosystem um, that doesn't necessarily have a user involved interactively. But of course, there's a lot of stuff that does have a user involved because the AS can say, you know what, for what you're asking for, I need to talk to a user. So I need to interact with them. And in XYZ, we signal that by allowing the client to say to the uh, authorization server, here's all of the ways that I am able to interact. Because ultimately, it's the client software that decides how it is able to interact with the user. It knows whether it's a web browser or an SPA or a light switch. Uh, it knows what it can do. Um, so it sends all of that information over. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of the combinatorics here, but I'm going to cover a couple of common uh, combinations. The first is effectively the authorization code flow from OAuth 2, uh, where the client says, I can redirect the user to an arbitrary URL that you give me, um, not knowing what it is ahead of time. And uh, I can take callbacks uh, as the result of that interaction on this specific URL. And by the way, I'm going to give you a nonce uh, to, to help secure that. We'll get into where that comes in in just a minute. The server is going to return and say, uh, yes, send the user to this URL, which I've just created in response to this request. And by the way, since you're using a callback, here's my nonce that we're going to also use to secure that callback. And the next time you come talk to me, here's a handle you can use to, uh, to reference all the stuff that we've been doing so far. So the client, uh, say it's a web browser, uh, sorry, web server-based client, it can just redirect the user over, or it can open a mobile and, you know, the protocol doesn't actually matter as long as the user gets there. The user uh, interacts with the server, logs in, authorizes, whatever all they need to do. And then uh, we call the callback of the client, and that has two bits of information. I'm not sure if my mouse is coming through, but uh, this interact reference down at the bottom uh, plays the role of the authorization code from OAuth 2 and the OAuth verifier from OAuth 1. And this hash right here is that security component that I was talking about before. Because what it is, is we hash together the nonce that the client sent in its first request, the nonce that the server returned in its response, and the interaction handle that just came back in the front channel. So we've tied together the front channel and the back channel with a simple hash that the client can validate to make sure that that interact reference that it's getting is tied to a specific request that it had made before. The client then takes that reference along with the handle that it got back and sends those back to the server in order to go hopefully get its access token and stuff at this point. The client here also has to prove possession of the same key that it used to start the transaction so that the server knows that it's the same piece of software that's coming and doing this follow-up. Um, this pattern right here already closes tons of potential attack vectors uh, that exist in all of today. If the client can't redirect but can only maybe chirp out a user code, we allow them to say that. This is the only interaction method that I can do, and the server come back with, oh, for the thing that you're asking for, sure, that's fine. Send the user to this static URL, which maybe you can't even display, so you know, put it on your packaging or something, but this is, gonna, this is not going to vary. But tell them this user code that will vary. This is the device flow from OAuth 2. 
while the user is uh, sent off to go do that, the client is going to be uh, polling with its transaction handle, and the server incidentally can come and say, you know, hold up, you know, wait another 30 seconds before you call me again, and here's another handle that you can use to, uh, to keep updating this because we have an opportunity to rotate back. A lot of people, when they see this, ask, you know, what about uh, being able to combine these two? What well, we realized in XYZ, we didn't actually need a separate mode to do that um, because it turns out that really what you're saying is I can get the user to an arbitrary URL or show them a code, but I can't have a, I don't have a callback. Um, you know, I don't have a front channel callback. So we can reuse that same mechanism because we've decoupled the various parts of the interaction. And the server comes back and says, here's an interaction URL, which we can then render as a QR code. Uh, here's a user code that the user can type in, um, and then the rest of the protocol uh, falls out exactly the same as it did before. Access tokens um, on the surface, there's nothing really new here. Uh, we can do a bearer token just like in OAuth 2, uh, but syntactically, since this is coming back as a substructure of the response, we now have an opportunity to hang additional information on it. So all of the questions that we're having about how do we bind, uh, you know, keys to tokens, whether it's embedded in the token or, or you know, not, where, how does the client get that material or even a reference to that material, we can now do that because we have the opportunity to hang that type of stuff um, on top of the access token uh, for all proof of possession type of tokens, which could be an MTL certificate hash or, or thumbprint or any number of things we have here as well. Uh, I've posted on the list about how uh, I would propose and how we built a way to do multiple uh, named access tokens and um, how to get back multiple named access tokens. Not going to go into those details here. Um, I've been having a lot of great discussion with uh, folks on the list and uh, had a call with Torsten earlier today. Um, we both agree that this is this is a really interesting space where uh, where we can do something that OAuth 2 really can't do. Um, it's just not set up to do. Now, I've met, uh, you may be thinking that uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in this protocol where the client is sending all of these giant objects. Um, you know, why should we force a client to do that? Can't I just register all of my information and send something else instead? That's where this notion of a handle comes in. And this is really where the polymorphic JSON starts to shine because using the exact same fields that we had before with the keys and the display and the resources field, we can now, instead of sending that giant object, we can send a string that the authorization server has created in order to reference the object uh, that the client would otherwise be sending by value. And um, I want to zoom in a little bit on that resources component um, because this is the type of, um, this is the type of string, which we would call a resource handle, that an API designer in working with their authorization server would say, you know, there's this common set of dimensions that people are asking for. So say they want, you know, email addresses from the user info endpoint for the current user, I can bundle that up and say that is now the string email. In other words, this is the OAuth 2 scope mechanism. And we can use it alongside of the rich authorization request type objects, the multidimensional objects, um, and the sort of predefined scopes, because the semantics of how these combine is exactly the same as how the uh, multiple bits of those uh, fully specified objects combine. Um, so it's reusing components, but in a way that allows them to be extended um, a lot more. Additionally, we can get these handles back, uh, not just uh, from a static registration, but the first time the client goes and talks to the AS, the AS can come back and say, oh, hey, that key that you sent me, again, not sure if my mouse cursor is pointing out, but that key that you sent me, um, instead of sending the key object, send this key handle, uh, it's the fourth field down here. Um, so, and I will know what that means. You know. Maybe this is going to be a thumbprint of the key. Maybe it's not, um, because it could ultimately be kind of like the uh, kind of like a client ID in that case, and we can tie the uh, the rights of other stuff to that. So this gives us dynamic and static registration and fully walk up non registered client interaction, all using the same structure. And to me, that's really really powerful. So, how do I think identity fits into it, and how does it fit into XYZ? Uh, as I've said on the list, and I said earlier on the call. 
Um, you really should be uh, querying what I, I like what George said, really just kind of identifiers and assertions about the current user. Um, I called them claims again to try and reuse uh, what was uh, what was already out there in other protocols to just say that, hey, here's stuff that uh, that I know about. I, this is stuff that I want to know about the current user and I get that back from the authorization server. Um, I would uh, additionally in XYZ, I don't have it in the example, but you can get um, signed assertions like an open ID connect ID token or verified uh, credential from the authorization server as part of this request and response as well. Um, any notions of session management and other stuff like that, that's, you know, I, I think that is outside of the scope of what we're after and not what I was intending when I wrote the charter text. But anyway, all of this comes just like OpenID Connect right alongside the access token um, in the same JSON structure. And uh, Aaron Parecki did a great blog post kind of laying out uh, sort of the why and how uh, that bit makes sense. Um, I also think it's incredibly important, uh, as Annabelle mentioned earlier, for the client to be able to push information to the authorization server as part of its request, but not just an identifier of who it thinks the user is. I also need the client to be able to say, I know who the user is and I can prove it. And I can prove that the user was verified to be using me and that they're here using um, you know, an ID token or a verifiable uh, claim proof that's tied to the client's key. There's a lot of really good things that we can do here because at that point, the AS might be able to say, I know what you're asking for. I know who the user is. I might be able to just, you know, bypass the, um, uh, all of the interaction stuff because we don't need it now. It was really important for us in XYZ to map things onto uh, OAuth 2, even though we're not necessarily using the, uh, we're definitely not using the same syntax and we're not using all the same structures. What we're doing instead is taking these concepts like a client ID and putting them into a space where instead of still calling it a client ID, we're, we're saying it, um, uh, we're tying it into the overall um, architecture in ways that actually uh, is consistent with other things. Same with all the proofing mechanisms. We can do that consistently across the things. I showed you how scopes work. We can do refresh tokens, even advanced stuff like persistent claims tokens and ID tokens, um, those concepts inside of XYZ, which means that from a developer's perspective, you can sit them down and say, hey, here's these arbitrary values that make your program do what it's supposed to do. Put them into this JSON object and send us to the server and it's going to work for you. This client simplicity is absolutely important here. And um, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on in the OAuth 2 world as well, uh, making a lot of these concepts available to the OAuth 2 world. Um, what we tried to do with XYZ is really kind of collect this stuff and in some cases invent this stuff. Um, in a way that wasn't uh, that wasn't tied down to the assumptions and background of OAuth 2. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, the details uh, of the protocol, including links to the spec and uh, other talks I've given, are on the website. Okay, we've okay, got. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, we're, we're just on time now, so we will not be taking questions um, unless Ben wants to raise a point as an AD. I should still have five minutes for questions, I believe. Nope. Okay. I'm not sure where that five minutes went then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we will do questions uh, in the discussion section uh, after Dick's uh, presentation now. No, this is Roman speaking. Let's just move on. Good. Okay. And where did Justin go so I can get the ball? You shouldn't actually need it. I didn't have it before. I was just able to share, but uh, you have it now. Okay. Your foo aren't uh, doing this is definitely better than mine. Okay, am I sharing now? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, so I was very excited when I saw Justin's uh, XYZ work. I really like the ideas of um, being, you know, the client authenticating directly to the AS and being able to have a much richer interaction between the client and the AS than trying to ram everything 
over in a redirect and you know if we'd have thought of that back when we were doing all of two we might have done that but there was a few things where i thought i had some different ideas around some pieces uh i looked at trying to go and add those into justin's draft but it just didn't seem to work so i wrote in uh, another draft to go and sort of capture all of my ideas my goal of that was really you know to expand the marketplace of ideas of what are the different things we could uh, be doing so the goals one want to make sure it's extensible in a number of different dimensions uh, to me i think it's really important that it's easy to migrate from OAuth to an open id connect that we're just you know people can very easily understand what, how they drop that in and work with it um, also let's reuse what we've already got before let's not we don't need to reinvent everything um, scalable having worked in aws for a while i have a much bigger appreciation for how de de decomposable and you know how you want different security parameters and similar to justin you know simple things are simple and hard things are possible something that i learned from larry wall back in my pearl days so here's the parties, the same parties that uh, Justin talked about, um, except that I call it a grant server instead of an authorization server, which I'll go into in more detail later on. Uh, key terms, claims, um, you know, this is information about the user provided by the GS. When I think of identity, this is uh, essentially I'm scoping it around to claims that, that are being moved around. Um, I, I don't think that session management is in there. Uh, to, answer mike's question authorization is you know what has what does the client have as access to the resource server um, the grant is a collection of authorizations and claims and so the grant is what the client is asking the grant server for and so i renamed it to grant server to encompass both authorizations and claims so that's the gs which if you're familiar with oauth and OpenID connect terms it's the as and the op and then the interaction, you know, uh, is as Justin defined, you know, how the user is interacting with the uh, GS. You know, how does how does the client, if it needs to, get the user over to the GS? And yeah. So here's a general sequence. Um, the client decides it wants to create a grant. The GS says, okay, I need to interact with the user. So it sends an interaction response. The, the client redirects the user over to the GS. The user is authenticate, authenticates at the GS and authorizes what the client asks for. The GS redirects the user back to the client and the client reads the grant and then it gets the grant response. So I'll go into detail on each of those steps. So the creating the grant, it's an HD post to the GS URI, which is the endpoint, um, includes information, has the client ID, the things in red, I'll go into more detail later on about. Um, and then it says what kind of interaction it's gonna be. And I'll go into more detail about that. The interaction response then is the GS, you know, creates a grant URI and a redirect URI. And so the grants are represented by a URI. And so you'll see that as being the URI. Um, and we'll pop that up later on when you see things. And then the redirect URI is where the user is going to get redirected to. Uh, what Justin had called interaction URI. So all these things in red, you know, this is pretty much the same way as OAuth, OpenID, Connect work. You know, the user gets redirected, stuff happens, bounces back. It's not really, it's part of the protocol, but isn't part of the API. So we'll skip to the seven, which is reading the grant. And so here the client is doing a get of the grant URI. And then the response is going to be um, the grant. And you know, so there's some um, you know stuff on top, and then you know, those are the key things in the response are the authorization and the claims. Um, so the request client object, you've got the two types of clients. I, I sort of view there's like the registered clients that have an ID. And so this drops in from being the same ID that you have in OpenID Connect and in OWASP deployments. So that existing deployments don't have to come up with some new identifier for their client. And then for a dynamic client, it self declares what it is. And, and the self, the dynamic client is, you know, creating its own key pair, signing that, sending it over. 
and then using that same key for all the subsequent requests. But since it's all the subsequent requests are going to be on the grant URI, the uh, GS knows which client you expect to be calling on that particular grant URI and so knows what key to be used. The interaction object, um, so I sort of a little bit similar to Justin, but a little more coarsely grained. The client can either get a redirect or not. And I think those are the, that, that's the a key interaction mechanism. Because if you can redirect back to the client, you can deal and uh, with uh, session fixation. But if you can't uh, redirect back to the client, then you know if you've got a scannable UR code or something like that, an attacker could take that and try to trick some you know a victim into clicking on that and granting access, and the victim won't know that they're just granted access to an attacker using a client. Um, so I split it like that, and then you provide different information. So the, the completion URI is where the uh, GS would redirect the user when it's done, and the information URI is also where the, if, if there, is where the GS would redirect the user when it's done, but that would not be to the client. That's essentially an information page that the client wants to show the, uh, wants the user to see as to sort of what are the next steps. Um, and then, of course, you know, this, there's also an exception point here for new interaction type. The authorization object in the request, um, so you can just have a OAuth 2 scope type. And so in the authorization, you can say it's a type of scope and then have the scope. Um, but it also can support other authorization types, you know, uh, RAR or XYZ style, which are similar to each other. Um, but it also, from an extensibility point of view, people might have other languages and other places or other ways of describing authorizations. And so by having a type, you can go and have different types of authorizations that you want to request. Multiple authorizations. Uh, in the current spec, I have it as a, an array. And so you either have authorization or authorizations in the request. And so we have the GS. I would imagine many GSs initially will only support what they're already doing in OAuth, so they would only support authorization. But if they can support multiple, then the client can ask for multiple authorizations, which I've currently got as a, an array of objects, or it could be a dictionary of objects similar to uh, the model that is in XYZ now, or you could do authorizations with polymorphism. That's number of different choices. I think it's a good discussion point to figure out what do we think is going to be easier for people to understand. And then the claims object, you have claims. Uh, there's a number of different claims types. So you can request OIDC, you know, an ID token or information and in user info. Um, and you can have other claim types like the OpenID Connect for Identity Association that's coming out or verified credentials that a W3C did. Um, and then you can extend and ask for other types of claims in here as well. So now we're moving over into the response as to what comes back. So coming back in the authorization is your um, is in that authorization object. And so if there's only one of those, um, it's either a URI that you then use to go and get the access token, or if it's a single use or limited time, Authorization, so there's no management that you know you can't renew it or anything. Then you actually get the token and the, the metadata about that. Um, and then in the authorization object, you know the JSON itself, you say the mechanism. And so here in the bottom one, we've got bear, but it could be other mechanisms like Jose or something like that. The response in the claims object. Um, you can see here that you know we requested uh, OpenID Connect, and so we've got an ID token, and we've got user info coming back. And so now, one of the things you got back then was the authorization or AZ URI. And so if you do a get on that, then you get back the you know the URI that you called. It lets you know that you got what you asked for, and all that authorization JSON. And so when you want to refresh a token, it's just another get to that same uh, AZ URI endpoint. 
Um, also added uh, discovery. And so if you do an options call to the GS URI, you get back essentially what does the, the grant server support for you? If it's an authenticated call, if it's an unauthenticated call, then potentially the grant server might only return back the types of authentications that it supports. So here's a list of all the APIs. I only covered sort of some of the ones. Um, but as you can see, it's very much of a URI resource with an HTTP verb for the different types of requests. You know, so you create a grant with a post to the GS URI, and then you can verify a grant, read a grant, update, delete a grant, all with different verbs. On the authorization URI, you can read it, update it, delete it. And the options call in GS is your main discovery point. But since we have options, you could go and find out, well, what verbs are supported on a grant URI or what verbs are supported on an authorization URI. Um, so a summary of the different URIs I've got, the GS URI, you can see sort of in the example, the structure. So the grant and AZ URI uh, start with the GS URI. And so another feature of that is that if you've got a, you know, GZ, you know a, a URI of a grant or a authorization, you know which grant server it came from, as opposed to just a random string, like a token, you know, that usually you get with a token. It's like, well, where did I get that token from? And then the redirect URI is the one that if you're going to be able to redirect um, back. The short URI, um, I call that because I think when you have a scannable call, call, a scannable code, you're trying to scan something, you need it to be shorter. It also is going to be in a different context as far as the GS concerned because it knows that it isn't going to be able to uh, redirect back. Um, and then the completion URI is the URI that the GS sends the client, or the user back to, and the information URI is what gets shown if they just want to show the information. Um, so some other features that I didn't go into, you know, that if the GS isn't ready to respond, it could say wait. And so that could map into a model where the GS needs to actually go and maybe uh, get authorization from some other place. And so it says, tells it to wait until it's all done before the client should call back. Uh, you have a bunch of different things you can do on a grant. You can update, verify, delete it, update and delete an authorization. Um, in the flow, I've got a flow in there where you can have a GS initiated grant creation so that the sort of uh, open ID, you know, the idea of a provider initiated login to an application. So you could start off at the GS, click a button, and the user could pop over into the app and uh, the app would be able to use the grant URI to make a call to go and get the information about which user it is. Reciprocal delegation, which is where the client and the GS are, are essentially a party A and party B, and each party is has both roles. And so how does each of them get authorization to the other one's resources? And then a couple of other features that sort of are for more advanced use cases. Uh, one of them is, you know, similar to Justin's, there's an idea of being able to identify which user you think it is and making the call. And so with this, the client could say, I've got a user, they gave me this email address, and I want to know if you've got somebody with that email address. And the GS would respond and says, yes, I have somebody with that email address. And so then that would enable the client to decide that they actually will surface uh, some experience to the user to use that particular GS, as opposed to, you know, they're sending somebody over to a GS without knowing whether or not that uh, GS has that user or not. And then interaction keep was an idea that since we've got a back channel going between the client and the GS, is that you could actually have mul a multiple steps of the GS asking for different releases of claims and or authorization. So it's multi-step. And so the client would be able to get each chunk along the way. And so you can envision a more advanced scenarios where uh, depending on the country the user's in, that the client may need to ask for different kinds of claims or different kinds of authorizations. And so it can update the grant as the user moves through and add different things that then the user is prompted for while still 
in the experience at the GS and then get sent back to the GS. So a number of these advanced ones, I, I did uh, sequence diagrams in the document to sort of help them out. So it looks like a lot of sequence diagrams, but they're really just using the same APIs in a few different ways. One of the other things that I did is I included a authentication mechanism in the draft um, to simplify for people picking it up that they're not having to go and look at some other thing for how to do it. You know, it could be broken out into a separate document and a, one of the great pieces of feedback Dustin gave me early in some earlier drafts was to factor how authentication happens out of the rest of the protocol. And so now it's all in one section and it's independent of everything else. So it's easy, easier for someone to use MTLS or HTTP signing as opposed to Jose. Um, my opinion is I think that the Jose is a, is a simple mechanism that can be used most places. Things like MTLS and HTTP signing map into some environments much better than Jose might. So when the client is making a call to, that should say actually Jose GS client authentication instead of AS. Um, if it's a get, delete, or options method, then it just puts it in the header, and that's the payload. You can see an example of get endpoint, you know, which is a grant call, and it's including it as a, author, as a Jose type in an authorization header. And if it's a post, put, or patch, you take all of the JSON, and that's the payload, and you sign that, and you send that Jose token over as the payload to the endpoint. And then you can use that same Jose mechanism when the client is calling an RS. And so for all of the verbs, you know, here's the header and the payload. And once again, you can see at the bottom that it's used an authorization header of type Jose, and then that's the uh, example Jose token being sent over. And so that allows you to have uh, uh, proof of possession API calls to an RS uh, using where the client's able to use the same key that it used for calling the GS. Take two minutes. You probably want to skip some. Uh, yep, I've got three slides. Um, so reviewing the goals. So the first one is extensible. Um, so I think we've, you know, we're extending on all these different points in the request and in the response and authentication mechanisms. From a migration, you know, here is the, what the request would look like from a client, right? And you drop in your existing client ID, OAuth scopes, and which claims you want to have, and reuse. We're using an awful lot of existing things. Uh, and scalable. Uh, on the grant server, because you've got different methods and different URIs, you can go and do routing to different services that are doing different types of things and, and break apart your thing as opposed to one big monolith. The sign body and, and header in the calls to the GS enable those to be passed down so that each of the components in your server can independently verify it. Um, you know, proof of possession is so much better as authentication is a shared secret now each of the components can verify who called without, of course, having the secret to verify it. Uh, the client, you can have a certificate chain of proof of possession versus shared secret for the client. And so that enables different instances of the client to have their own uh, private key. And the resource server in the proof of possession mechanism, you could have a certificate from the GS that delegates the client ID so that the RS knows, okay, you are the client that was talking to my GS, and I can see that that binds the token that I got. Um, simple and flexible, I think so, and questions. And I think that's the end of my time as well. Thank you, Dick. So before we move to the next section, uh, Dick and Justin will share the mic. Dick prepared a few slides to focus the discussion on different on uh, uh, specific differences uh, between the two uh, proposed protocols. Uh, however, please also use this uh, section uh, to ask clar clarification questions about either or both of the protocols. And with that, yes, Dick. 
Um, so the first we, uh, Justin and I did some back channel uh, discussion on the differences between our two documents, and we came up with sort of five major um, areas. Um, and so we posted each of these out to the mailing list, and then I've got a slide for each of those. I'm also trying to find my uh, uh, chat window to figure out. While you're you at it, someone yeah. actually bothered to uh, to count the number of people on the blue sheet. Uh, so if you haven't yet signed the blue sheet, please do so now. And thank you, Robert. All right. Um, so, Dick, how did you want to run this section? Do you want us to just make a, a quick statement on uh, on each bit as we go through, and then field questions, or what? Um, sure. Why don't we start? Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm trying to find my chat window again. <laughs> um, you go ahead while I'm doing that. Did, did we lose Dick from the connection? No, he's still here. I'm here. Yeah, did you hear me? Did you hear me? Did I lose audio? Can people hear me? I can hear you. Can hear you. So Justin, Dick is saying you should go ahead. I can't hear anything. Okay. Okay, so people people can hear me. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to Dick, so um, I'll just start this bit and uh, until we get back. Um, so basically, in X Y Z, um, the client says these are all of the things that I can do, including separating um, whether or not uh, I can get a user out to you versus whether I can get a user back. Um, those are two separate fields in X Y Z. So that's for the same reasons that uh, X off. Um, splits out the authentication type, and the AS responds to all of the capabilities in that list that it can actually support and that match what the client is asking for, uh, because different policies uh, might say that it can do different things. XOF uses a type-based system um, where the client states, uh, and as per the current version, really only whether or not it can do a redirection. Um, so either you can redirect or you can't, um, but uh, with the type field, it's intended to be uh, extensible to other other kinds of things. Um, so uh, either you respond with that, or you or you throw an error. Um, still, all right. So Dick is unmuted. Um, Oh, I can. Oh, I'm, oh, there we go. I got my little window. Okay. Uh, I will say for for my part here on the XYZ project, we actually started with a type based system like XAuth has, and after we implemented it, realized we didn't like it. Um, and then we, once we had decoupled the different parts of the interaction request, uh, we found that that drastically simplified our code, uh, especially on the authorization server side. Um, honestly, didn't change things that much for the client uh, because the client was always fairly simple. It's just each client is probably going to send the same thing every single time anyway. Um, uh, but that that was our experience with the interaction. Um, um, still don't hear anything from Dick, but Annabelle's on the queue. Um, Yarn, you okay with me running queue while, while Dick sorts ahead. audio issues? Uh, no problem, but Dick is oh, actually. I can't hear Dick at all. I'm sorry if you've been talking this whole time. I, I, I am talking. You don't hear me? Can no, I, can I, hear I, I can hear you. Hear you. Justin cannot hear you. That's funny. Annabelle, please. <laughs> <laughs> Annabelle, go ahead. Um. Oh, are we doing Q and A in the middle? I, I figured you were going to do the Q nope, at the end of nope. all of these. Okay. We, we were going to do um, Q. We were going to do Q and A on each you know, on each topic uh, and and okay. scope each topic. That makes good sense. All right. I'll uh, on the interaction note. Then I guess uh, is, we talked about this on the list back and forth a bit, but 
Uh, to me, it's it's very important for the client to be able to request uh, multiple capabilities because it is there are a variety of, of scenarios where the client may not exactly know until it tries whether or not it can successfully redirect. Um, it also may not necessarily know which mechanism the end user is going to prefer to do. Uh, there's situations where, where it might be capable of technically opening, might, might technically be capable of opening a URL, but uh, the end user won't actually want it to do that in you know, the, 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 the whatever environment it's in, uh, whatever environment the client is running in. It would prefer to do a, a indirect uh, flow instead. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of the client being able to request multiple interaction mechanisms uh, and either decide or, or give the end user the option of choosing you know, which one to move forward with. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that the, I mean, the client knows what it can do. And to me that the, the key thing, which was a security point of view, which was can the, can the GS get the user back to the client or not was sort of a, a key pivot point. Um, and so in XAuth, the, you know, if it's an indirect interaction, then the GS sends, you know, a short URL and sends a, a display URL and a code to the client and it can decide what it wants to do and show it to the user, which then, you know, if the client is able to do both of those then the user gets to choose. Yeah, and um, in XYZ, we signal the exact same thing by whether or not the client includes the callback as part of its interaction, because the, the redirect flag and the callback flag are separate from each other for exactly that same reason, because the security properties are very different. But Dick, I was looking at XMOS, uh, the, the current draft. I it looked to me like the, the client was choosing one or the other, indirect or, or redirect. Um, is that is that not the case? So when you say redirect, it can mean two things. Can the right. client redirect? Okay, when I say redirect, it means can the GS redirect the user back to the client? Uh huh. Right. Right. So yes, the client the client right. is choosing between those two things because the client knows whether it can get the whether the GS is able to get it back to it or not. Um, whether or not the GS can get it back get back to the client depend, may depend on which interaction method the end user chooses. For example, I could, as a native app, open a URL in my environment and also fire up a web server that's listening on localhost. Um, and so that means if, if, if the end user goes you know, through the direct route, basically, on that device, they'll be able to get back to me. But if they were to, um, you know, open that URL on another device, or if they were to opt for the indirect route uh, instead, um, they're not going to be able to redirect. You know, the GS at that point is not going to be able to redirect back to me because they're going to be on a different device that I'm not, you know, doesn't have my web server listening on it. Uh, the the you, you see, scenario for this would be if a if, if an app is running in an environment that technically is capable of opening a browser, but not one where the customer actually wants it to. For example, if it's a, 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 a CLI program running mm -hmm. in a server on a, on, a, on a headless service or a server. Right. Um, well, maybe walk through there. If, you know, mm -hmm. if, the, if there's an, a, an intersection where both of them could happen, but as yep. I thought about it, I thought that you either are in one or the other. Um, but um, yeah, just yeah. throwing that out as an idea, because to me, the, uh -huh. whether you can come back or not, it's important because the the GS may say, I am not going to interact with clients that are indirect. Right? Mm -hmm. I am only going to go and hand this, or, or there's only certain types of information I'm going to hand to a client yep. if it's indirect. Yep. Yeah, I I, I agree. Okay. In in the because and I think you mentioned it either in the slides or in, in XSoft doc. The 
you know, the issue fundamentally being about whether you can you know, have that session fixation or whether you can uh, confirm that you're in the same session um, when, when you come back to the client. Uh, and that's an important security property, and I think we want to make sure that GSs have have an ability to understand whether or not that capable capability is in play. Um, I, I I don't think it's necessary to couple sort of the redirect, the ability to redirect to the GS and the ability to redirect back to the the client in order to do that. Right, and I will say it is exactly that decoupling that drove us to yeah. current structure in XYZ. It, it was figuring out that we we could decouple it and get both the behavior that a type-based interaction uh, system gives and additional kinds of stuff and additional kinds of flexibility that we really wanted. Um, so we've got a case where um, users might be able to go to a web page or might be able to send a message to an agent that's installed on their device. You know, we don't know necessarily ahead of time what is going to be the right answer. It's kind of up to what the user is doing in the client and what they're asking for, what that's going to be. So the client basically says, I can send you to a web, I can send someone to a web page or I can relay a message that you might have to their agent what would you like? And the auth server can come back with, I can do, I can do both of those. So, you know, you, you, you now get to pick. Um, and that is, uh, as, as Annabelle was saying, also still separate from how the user gets back to the client because of the session fixation thing, which, uh, which is what the whole hashing thing is for. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so, uh, so, so that our, our um, ADs signaling, we should probably move on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we should, we can take this onto the list. Mm -hmm. The, uh, to me, it was important that the GS knows, or am I going to be able to redirect the user back or not? And that's a yeah. clear signal that the, the client can't choose which one it wants to do afterwards. So I'm um, going to go to the next slide. Everybody see, can you see that Justin? Yes. Yes, I can. I can, I can hear you now. I just had to restart WebEx. So we're good. Okay. And then just from a time check, we've got uh, seven, seven minutes left. Sorry. You're on. Go ahead, Dick. Okay. Um, so uh, TLDR version uh, on XYZ, there is a single URL that the client always talks to, and it gets uh, identifiers. Um, that it uses to reference things in between requests, um, and uh, you know that's 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 the whole API. And in XAuth, I factored it off so that you had each type of thing was a resource, and you use different methods depending on what you were trying to do against it. Pretty simple. Okay. Yeah, and um, so I will say here that uh, what's specified in XAuth is in the direction of what we had talked about at one point in XYZ, but never uh, never went down to implementing. Um, and uh, in, in all honesty, I think that the right answer is somewhere in between these two. Um, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I'd have to actually build the thing. Um, but, um, you know, I don't think that there's a lot of uh, I don't think that there's a lot of contention here, um, uh, especially if we're going to be going in the direction of multiple access tokens, uh, which again we you know we just implemented um, like what last Thursday or whatever. Um, then I want to uh, it, it makes sense to start to separate management of individual access tokens as opposed to the uh, the transaction overall or what. Uh, Xoft calls the grant overall. Um, and I'm not so, seeing anybody in the queue, Justin. Why don't we move to the yeah, next let's one. let's move on there. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, client authentication. There's there's actually a fair amount of overlap between the two drafts uh, now um, because fundamentally it's about uh, you know presenting JSON. In uh, the biggest question is kind of you know. 
what the signaling discovery and mandatory to implement mechanisms are. Um, in XYZ, at least as we've written it, um, there is no MTI because, you know, it's a small project and we just kind of do things. Um, for a specification, I think that that's something the working group needs to, um, uh, needs to answer. Yeah. So, and then in XOF, uh, wanted it to be e easy to go and factor in other ones, but that um, the idea would be that Jose would be MTI um, and that you'd be able to, um, as opposed to having detached signatures, I'm in favor that the, the posted message is a, a token. And so that then inside of machinery within a GS, that token may, can move around as opposed to having to move two pieces around of the, the JSON that maybe gets munched up or something like that and then that no longer matches the detached signature. Right. Uh, I see Annabelle's in the queue. Right, go ahead. So, uh, XAuth Jose authentication mechanism, it seems like XAuth is basically rolling a new uh, author is authentic client authentication mechanism here right. and I'm wondering why and certainly I, I, I do not think that this protocol document is the right place for us to be doing that uh, uh, in particular with uh, our regarding RS calls uh, I think a, a authentication mechanism that requires uh, that, that forces changes on the API uh, itself by changing the body is a non-starter for a lot of use cases. Right. And um, oh, yeah. there's there's no change I, on the body. Well, yeah, the body is now a Jose object, and um, the body is only a Jose object in the GS API calls. It's always a header in an RS call. Oh, is it? Okay. I, I yeah. looking yeah. at it, I thought you were changing the body for RS as well. Nope. Nope. Okay. So that, that since, since since the GS doesn't exist, you uh -huh. can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So right. I'll I'll retract do? I'll retract the RS uh, uh, side of the issue, but I still uh, maintain that this is not the right place for us to be uh, rolling a new uh, authentication mechanism, particularly given that ones exist. Right. And I just wanted to make uh, one additional point uh, based on what Dick was saying. That if your uh, if your architecture can keep the bytes of the Jose object intact when passing things around, it can keep the bytes of the JSON intact as well. So I I honestly find that to be a bit of a red herring. No, well, your mileage may vary. I've definitely seen people blow that one up. But, oh, uh, I have, but only when yeah. they haven't been required to do it. And yeah, no. Next and slide. So I got a minute of slide. Really hard. Yep. So what we tried to do with XYZ was um, to map concepts into a structure that was internally consistent instead of just applying things that existed um, before, just because we had uh, taken one solution in OAuth 2 did not mean that we would take that same solution in XYZ. And uh, so what that basically means is that there's a lot of um, translation uh, between the two worlds uh, that that makes sense. Um, so you know, uh, there's a there's a key handle if you've got a registered client and you don't want to pass the public key itself, but that always represents the key which is used for dynamic clients. And you know, little little things like that in order to simplify the overall uh, the overall protocol structure and to make things easier to understand both from a developer and from a conceptual perspective. And in XAuth, I went with much more of a let's take those values and find a place for them within the uh, request so that it's the, the friction on somebody knowing where and what to do is lower and that's easy for them to understand. And also that uh, there's likely going to be different ways of requesting claims and different ways of requesting authorizations. And so typing those as opposed to defining uh, new language in it. And I see no one in the queue. Let's move to our last slide because we're... All right, there. so um, 
So, uh, Dick, if you don't mind, I'll just summarize um, that uh, in XYZ, we've got an inline discovery mechanism. Uh, XAuth uses options. I really, you know, and I've said this on the list, I, I think our eventual solution will have some mix of both. Um, I think that it makes sense to do some pre-flight on, on uh, what XYZ would call the transaction endpoint. I, I'm not convinced on the others, but I understand that that's, you know, that's part of the idea of XOff. Um, but uh, I also think that being able to do things fully dynamically without a discovery step beyond knowing just the transaction endpoint is a really, really, really powerful thing uh, that, that clients can do. Um, so I, I think eventually we're probably going to have some mix of both. Um, Dick, your thoughts? Uh, well, I think there's always, you know, uh, here's what I'd like to get and you get back what, what happens, some negotiation. Um, mm -hmm. But I did think it was important to have, I would like to know what you can do before I start doing things and have an API for that. So the options okay. call, and since we've got URIs for each different thing, then you can go and, you know, do options on each of them. Right. And to me, and I think that this is this is true for both of the protocols, uh, something that's really important uh, for XYZ was that the client has one piece of information to start off, and that's the transaction endpoint. Um, there are a lot of attacks against OAuth because the authorization endpoint and token endpoint and discovery endpoint, and, uh, key endpoint, and all of this other stuff are different. And the discovery document now becomes an attack surface because it's up to the client to correctly piece all of those together. Um, you know, there's the yeah. substitution attack, the mix-up attack, all this other stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm and I'm fully aligned on that because you know, effectively, XAuth works like that. You have the GSURI, and all the other endpoints are ones that you got from calling that, and they're all, you know, right. dynamic and specific to the client. The client doesn't know them until it gets them. Right. So in many ways, it's sort of, you know, packing the identifier and the, you know, the TX endpoint, the you know, the XYZ endpoint in the same thing, but just making that a URI. So it's kind of like a handle plus a URI was modeled. Oh, but then when I realized I was doing that, I thought, oh, if I'm doing that, then I can just have different methods on it because it's a URI. Right. Uh, I don't see anybody in the queue. We're almost out of time. Was there something else you wanted to, to conclude with? Dustin, otherwise I'm going to um, yeah, go go ahead. We can we can follow up on the list. Uh, there's there's been good discussion. Uh, okay, Mike uh, Mike just joined the queue. Okay, go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> yeah, this is a very old comment that I was going to make on Justin's X Y Z, but it also pertains to XOS that. The X Y Z claims slide showed some claims, some of which came from the JSON Web Token Claims registries, such as email and a uh, few others, but it also invented some, and it didn't say where that invention was occurring. This, to me, is an example of uh, sort of de facto inventing a new identity schema without trying to reuse the others, whereas the XAuth presentation showed explicitly that it was reusing claims already in our existing registries, which is part of what makes me much more in favor if we have a starting draft of starting with XAuth and XYZ because it's not trying to reinvent identity schema. And I mean, I'll, I'll repeat what I said uh, during the charter discussion is that there are a lot of different identity schemas out there. Um, OpenID Connect is one of them. And uh, for the types of information that uh, that we want to get back, I mean, I don't think we want to adopt all of uh, OpenID Connect or, um, or Jot uh, inside that response. I don't think we want to encourage people to Put all of that information in there. I do think it should be limited. Um, and I'm not whether, saying whether those claims, whether those claims uh, that we we use come from OpenID or from Skim or from some schema.org thing, I think is a working group decision. And um, I don't think that that should really be input to um, to which is the starting draft. I, I think that that's a syntactical bike shedding question. 
Um, uh, sorry, no, to, sorry to interrupt you guys, but uh, we have uh, five minutes and we need to wrap the discussion. Uh, so, uh, thank you everyone for uh, lots of good inputs. We, uh, we need to uh, do some more work uh, on the charter and we will continue doing that on the mailing list. We've had really good discussion over the last week, uh, so I expect uh, more of that uh, in the coming days. Uh, we will discuss with the AD whether we uh, need to have a discussion specifically on the deltas uh, from the charter that was previously published or whether we want to have a repeat consensus call uh, once we have a new version of the charter. Um, Dick, anything you'd like to add before we uh, hand it over to Roman? I'm ready to hand it over to Roman. You know, besides thanking everybody for all the great feedback and showing up, you know, we've got a, a large group here and I appreciate everyone's patience as we're trying to manage a virtual meeting. Uh, hi, uh, this is Roman wrapping up. Yeah, I, I second that. Thank you everyone for your flexibility and patience with this all virtual format given this unprecedented these unprecedented circumstances, and to you, Dick and Yaron, as well. You uh, you ran kind of this first meeting of the week for us, and that's kind of tricky. And hopefully, we'll also learn how to iron out some of the details for the rest of the week. Per this, Boff, what really excites me is you know we're talking about solutions, we're talking about running code, but I would really urge us not to get ahead of ourselves. I mean, we need to refine the scope. The discussion here enumerated a number of places where. Where, where we need to get that clarity. We're of course gonna to have to take that back to the list. And I think in the absence of that scope and that clarity, it's gonna be difficult to really talk, talk too quickly about implementations. So as was just mentioned, I mean, the next step is we need to take this feedback we just got here back to the manual list, see how that, how, see how that relates to the charter text we have and kind of from there, figure out kind of the plan. So the chairs and I will chat about how, uh, how we can do that with an incremental diff or whether we're gonna, we're gonna reissue consensus. But again, kind of thank you for all that feedback and for those all online, please do, uh, you know, please do kind of watch the mailing list for discussions. And as one last call administratively, you know, please fill out the blue sheets before you exit. There is a noticeable diff between the number of participants in WebEx and in, uh, uh, on the virtual blue sheet, please. So please do go in there. So again, kind of thanks everyone, out. Thank you, Roman. Yeah, I'm gonna post a link to the blue sheet if I can find it in the chat. Or if somebody else has, oh, there we go. We'll hang out, we've got another two minutes left. One minute left. Because I think when we close it off, the chat goes away and everybody loses the link. We should have spoken more slowly. <laughs> uh, so next steps, we'll, we'll work, work on. Uh, I, I think it might and be worth going through the charter and tuning that all up. Close the chat. All right. So um, as as I mentioned earlier, uh, I will take an action to uh, propose a diff to uh, the uh, the original charter, just like I did the other day. Um, I'm going to diff from the original one that Yaron made the uh, consensus call on, um, not the latest one. So it'll be a it'll be a complete diff, um, yeah. incorporating the mm -hmm. feedback from the secondary one and also uh, from some of the discussion today, because I think there were a few clarifying terms that I picked up today, um, especially on the identity side of things that, um, that will hopefully, um, hopefully nail things down better. And I will get that out to the list uh, probably tomorrow at this point. Uh, Dick and Justin, please go through the minutes. Uh, I really don't feel like going back to the recording, but we might need to if, uh, you feel that uh, things were uncovered appropriately. So please take a look. All right, we'll okay. do. thank you. 
Okay, that's time, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Cheers. Thank you very much.